So welcome to the Fiscal 2021 Cultural Development Fund Application Seminar. I'm Laudan Hamidi Tusi. Joining me today from the DCLA program staff are Ashley Firestone and Stacey McMath. Um, we'll be working together to present this webinar and answer your questions. And uh, the webinar will also be recorded and a version with closed captioning will be made available on our website shortly after the conclusion of the webinar. So the seminar will review the steps required to complete an eligible application to the Department of Cultural Affairs for fiscal year 2021. If you have not done so already, we uh, suggest you download both the application instructions and the CDF guidelines documents. We've included those links in the chat box for this webinar. Um, and these documents will be referenced throughout the presentation and go into even more depth. If there are any questions in Spanish, you can request assistance from a Spanish speaking program specialist by calling our help desk at 212-513-9381. So we've divided this presentation into several sections and we'll take questions throughout the webinar. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to ask a question at any time. Um, behind the scenes here, we'll be monitoring your questions uh, throughout the webinar and reserving time to answer them in batches. Please do not use the chat function for content questions. Use that Q&A button. I'm going to give you a brief overview of CDF program funding and the CDF life cycle and how this process works. Um, my colleagues Ashley and Stacy will then review the fiscal 2021 application section by section and there will be uh, ample opportunities for you to ask questions at specific points and at the end of each section. Uh, this presentation is a version of the live seminar that DCLA presents throughout the five boroughs. If you would like to ask in-person questions of the program's unit staff, dates and locations for the remaining in-person seminars can be found at the same Eventbrite page you use to register for this webinar. We do strongly suggest that you stay for this presentation in full. The New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, known to many in our field as simply DCA, will be using its official city abbreviation of DCLA to avoid confusion with the Department of Consumer Affairs. Um, so we'll use DCLA throughout, and you're going to see that um, all throughout this application, or excuse me, presentation uh, to refer to our agency. So first, let's look at an overview of the Cultural Development Fund process and the life cycle of program funding. CDF supports a broad range of public services provided by New York City's nonprofit arts and cultural organizations uh, and cultural activities of recognized quality accessible to the public. Funded projects can be as different as the organizations providing them, but they will have a common commitment to serving the public and providing that public access to cultural activities. It's your responsibility as the applicant to define public access as it applies to the organization and make it clear throughout the application. You define who your public is and you define how you are giving that public access to your programming. For your organization, that public may be defined broadly, but it also may be more narrowly defined as a targeted audience, such as individual artists or other arts organizations, middle school students or seniors. So here on the screen, you're seeing um, some current information on the outcomes from the fiscal 2020 application process. That was our most recent grant cycle. We saw 1,157 eligible applications submitted last year, including 384 from organizations that had received award recommendations in a prior competitive pool and were able to renew their grants. 763 eligible applications were reviewed by competitive panels and 69% of those received a recommendation from the peer panel, including 183 organizations awarded multi-year grants. With 36% of new applicants receiving a panel recommendation, it is possible for new applicants to be successful in the CDF process, but with more applicants than ever in the pool, and we have not seen an increase in our baseline um, budget, it, it is increasingly competitive. So in the middle of the screen, we have highlighted uh, February 18th. You've seen this date before and you'll see it again. This is the deadline for the fiscal year 21 application, Tuesday, February 18th, 2020 at 11.59 p.m. 
The application will be due on a Tuesday this year due to the President's Day holiday on Monday. Uh, and that is the reason is why for that is the DCLA office will be closed. Um, this deadline is hard and fast for both the online submission and the paper supplemental materials. There are no exceptions to this deadline. Last year, uh, we did see eight organizations that missed the deadline for either the online submission or the uh, hard copy supplemental materials. Um, please don't let that happen to your organization. And also note that the deadline for the supplemental materials is a received by deadline. Hard copies of the supplemental materials must be received in our offices no later than February 18th, 2020, whether via US Postal Service or another mail carrier or hand delivery. Organizations that fail to meet either the online deadline or received by deadline for supplemental materials uh, will be ineligible for funding for fiscal 21. And we'll discuss methods of delivery a little bit more in the end of the seminar. So what happens once the CDF applications are submitted? The DCLA program staff members review the applications and uh, confirm that each applicant's borough, discipline, and FY18 income are correctly indicated. So we would be in touch with you if we have any questions about any of those categories. We'll also ensure that the required supplemental documents have been included and uh, check for completeness because incomplete submissions will be ineligible for CDF funding. Once those applications are reviewed for completeness, the application forms are submitted to panelists for qualitative review in advance of the panel. Panelists, uh, excuse me, panels are convened and the applications are reviewed beginning in March. Uh, last year, the volume of applications meant we held 23 panels. And when those panels conclude, the panelists' recommendations are submitted to the commissioner for review and approval. And notifications to applicants go out after the recommendations are approved as it is adopted. There are further paperwork required of grant recipient. We ask that, um, when award notifications are sent. Reporting on annual activities is a requirement for all funded organizations every year. Online reporting forms will be available on our website in the spring and are due at the conclusion of the services, but no later than August 1st. Applicants that do not comply with reporting requirements are ineligible for funding for two subsequent fiscal years. So before we move on to the guidelines, uh, we're going to pause to take any questions about the CDF life cycle. All right, no questions. We'll move right on. Don't forget to type any questions that you have into that Q&A box. Um, so moving on to the guidelines, uh, the guidelines are critical to the application process. Applicants must be familiar with the guidelines before completing the application. The guidelines are available for download on our website. That's nyc.gov culture. And throughout the rest of this section, we're gonna address the guidelines and funding requirements. But if you have questions on this topic, um, please use the Q&A function found at the bottom of the screen to type your question and uh, we'll uh, open it up for questions at the end of the section. So these are the basic requirements for eligibility for CDF funding. An applicant must be a cultural organization administratively based in one of the five boroughs of New York City as demonstrated by the organization's address on its fiscal year 2018 IRS 990. Uh, incorporated as a nonprofit in New York State as of the organization's fiscal year ending in 2018, current with New York State Charities Bureau filings, in possession of a unique federal employee identification number or EIN, um, certified tax exempt under IRS code 50, section 501c3 and able to demonstrate at least two years of cultural public service in New York City. If your organization is incorporated as a nonprofit but does not have its own 501c3, you may be eligible to apply, but you must use an approved fiscal sponsor or conduit. We use those terms interchangeably. Your organization will be required to provide evidence that your agreement with the conduit is current. Um, and if you're not sure about whether or not your conduit is eligible, uh, please ask a question or call the help desk or you talk to your program officer um, after this webinar. Organizations whose incorporation dates are in their FY19 or FY20 will not be eligible to apply during this cycle. In this case, uh, you'll need to wait uh, until you've had that two year um, history to apply. Organizations whose original incorporation filings were outside of New York State uh, will be required to submit a certificate of foreign authority from the New York State Department of State. 
So moving on, further eligibility uh, review, applicants cannot be individual artists. There are DCLA regrant funds that are administered uh, by the local arts councils on our behalf that are dedicated to individual artists. You also can't be a member of the cultural institutions group. Um, applicants cannot be delinquent in previous reporting to DCLA. Uh, based outside of the five boroughs, uh, even if you're offering programs in New York City, um, because New York City residency is, is part of the basic eligibility and it will be determined using the address on the organization's fiscal year 2018-990 form. And if your organization's fiscal year 2018-990 indicates an address outside of the five boroughs, uh, but you are based in New York City, you'll need to submit a letter of explanation with your supplemental materials. If your organization's primary mission is other than arts and culture, you must have a long-standing record of cultural programming, demonstrate programs of in-depth artistic quality that are accessible to the public, provide written documentation regarding any annual filing exemptions, and submit cultural and organizational budgets. So this applies to what we call social or multi-service organizations, also religious institutions or organizations providing general uh, non-arts education. Your application uh, will be reviewed by a panel based on the portion of your fiscal 2018 operating income that relates to your cultural activities. And as one of these institutions, it is imperative that you have separate financial and programmatic information available for the cultural component of your organization for all fiscal years since 2018. If you're not sure if your organization has this, definitely confirm with your bookkeeper that you can provide that required information prior to the February 18th deadline. And there's a lot more information in the guidelines about these uh, types of applicants. If you're an organization whose mission is to provide arts education, not general education or things, but your arts education based, this is not applicable to you. We expect applicants to be fiscally responsible and administratively competent, demonstrated by submission of appropriate financial statements, a realistic proposed budget, and satisfactory reporting, among other things. Programs should be of recognized quality, exemplified by the submitted materials. Uh, organizations are required to have a track record of two years of service in New York City, as we mentioned before, and you help establish this with your fiscal 2018 and 2019 activities, financial documents, and an SMU data arts profile. If you incorporated in your fiscal year 2019 or 2020, uh, when, as we mentioned before, are not eligible yet for this process, look into the DCLA regrant program and administered for us by the local arts council in your borough. In Manhattan, it's the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, but there's one in each borough. So uh, you can also find information about that on our website. Note that if you're awarded CDF funds in fiscal 21, you will not be eligible for a DCLA regrant from your local arts council in the same fiscal year, though you may be eligible for other grants that they administer. Your proposed projects must also meet all of the following qualifications. Uh, so taking place within the five boroughs of New York City, within fiscal 2021, which is July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2021, cultural activity of recognized quality, accessible to the public, clearly stated measurable goals within the organization's capacity and diverse in funding sources. Public access during fiscal 2021 is the key component of activities funded by CDF. The guidelines uh, contain a longer list of examples, but here are a few. Um, we fund creation of new work and or restoration of existing work for public presentation, that part is key. Arts education programs, community-based arts activities, services that assist New York City's artists and arts organizations, training programs, uh, and presentation of works in progress. DCLA can fund any of these activities, but only if the public access um, component falls between July 1st, 2020 and June 30th, 2021 um, within the five boroughs of New York City. Remember also that you're applying to the Department of Cultural Affairs. The activities for which you're requesting funding should be cultural in nature. Um, we include the humanities and sciences in our definition of culture, and so uh, there is a little bit of a broader definition there, but what's not included here are physical fitness, social services, or general education, things like that. 
um, please ask a question or speak to your program officer or call the help desk if you have questions about eligibility of your project. So also keep in mind what we don't fund. Uh, please do not ask DCLA to support activities outside of the city's fiscal year or outside of the five boroughs. We do expect you to fundraise, but we cannot fund you to do so. So don't request support for a special event gala or something similar. Uh, capital projects, including equipment purchases and construction, fall under a different unit at DCLA. So not um, something that would be under this application to request. Lobbying or other governmental advocacy can be helpful for organizations to receive funding from elected officials, but these funds may not be used towards those efforts. Uh, if you are a library or degree granting institution or closely affiliated with or housed at one, please be in touch with us uh, separately to inquire about eligibility before applying. DCLA can also cannot fund proposals for general operating support or internal capacity building. You do have to propose projects that provide services to the public. However, note that if you're awarded funding, as long as those services are delivered as described, you may use CDF funding to cover any programmatic costs that are not capital expenditures, fundraising, or government advocacy efforts. Your CDF proposed projects uh, also cannot include activities funded by any other um, initiatives administered through this agency, including mostly the initiatives designed by city council, CASA, SUCASA, that kind of thing. We'll get a little bit more in depth in that in later in the seminar. So note these specific policies regarding CDF funding. Uh, CDF can provide funding for up to five projects. Uh, we'll discuss this more in depth when we review the application later in the presentation. Applicants are reviewed, or excuse me, applications are reviewed as a whole, and panels recommend funding for an entire application they don't select from among the projects presented. Funded organizations are expected to do all of the projects proposed at the level at which they are proposed. Remember this as you plan your application and keep in mind that out of all the applicants last year, only about 4% were funded at their full request and nearly half of those requested the minimum amount. So just to give you some context, in FY20, awards were on average 7% uh, of organizations' total project costs. So you may request up to 50% of the cost of your project from the CDF, but you must be realistic in planning your request. We, we expect to be one of many partners supporting your organization. Remember that while applicants request funds for unique programs and are evaluated on their public services, funds received from CDF can be used to cover any operating costs except capital expenditures, government advocacy efforts, or fundraising. And while in-kind support can often be critical to an organization, do not include it in any of the budget figures you provide. There is a specific section in the application where we ask for details regarding any in-kind support. So your fiscal 2018 operating income is a critical figure in the application process. All right, sorry for that. Just lost my place a little bit, apologies. Um, so we're gonna review the panel process. Uh, each panel is made up of arts representatives from the field, plus a representative from the city council and for borough specific panels, a representative from the borough president's office. We are really um, hopeful to that you can help us staff our panels with a broad spectrum of representatives from the field. If you are interested in recommending somebody to serve as a panelist, uh, you can submit a nominations form through our website. If you'd like to serve yourself, please nominate yourself. Um, panelists provide a valuable service to the agency in our field, and we do hear from a lot of them that they learn a lot during the process, so um, we invite you to do that. The, the form is online. So we have a two-tiered system for panel review, which is based on your organization's actual FY18 operating income. Groups with budgets of $250,000 or less are evaluated according to the borough in which the proposed activities take place, not necessarily where the organization is located. Um, and in boroughs where volume demands it, panels are further grouped by the discipline each organization indicates in the application. 
smaller organizations, budgets, and programs often fluctuate, and we're able to keep in closer contact with these groups through an annual funding process. So they're eligible for single year support. Groups with budgets of more than $250,000 are evaluated by panels that are discipline specific and they're eligible for multi-year support. And if you're a social or multi-service organization or an educational or religious institution, one of those organizations that has a primary mission beyond arts and culture, again, you'll be placed in the panel based on your fiscal 18 cultural budget, not your overall organizational budget. Many of the organizations in this budget category will have last been reviewed by a competitive CDF panel in fiscal 18. Uh, remember, previous funding is no assurance that the organization will be funded again. The panels will review fiscal year 21 applications through the highly competitive panel process described in this presentation. A fiscal 2021 award will repeat at the same level in fiscal 2022 and 2023, assuming the organization remains current with reporting. Continuation of that award amount is dependent on the overall fiscal health of the city and the agency. If funded, your award letter will note the amount for the upcoming fiscal year, not for all three years of the multi-year award. So the panel review follows our funding priorities, artistic dialogue, audience development, education, preservation, public access, and services to the field. Each panel will review proposals with DCLA's funding priorities and organizational criteria in mind. Detailed examples relating to each of these funding priorities can be found in the guidelines. Remember that DCLA requires that all CDF funded projects be accessible to the public. Um, the participants or audiences you serve, whether the general public, students, arts professionals, seniors, or any audience particular to your organization's programs, they have to be able to access your programs within fiscal year 21. These funding priorities are the focus of CDF support, and applicants' proposed services need not meet all of the priorities listed, but the panel will expect projects to align with at least one. And note that these priorities are not themselves in priority order. The panel uh, reviews based on these organizational criteria, organizational responsibility, artistic and organizational excellence, impact, and uniqueness of service. They're gonna evaluate an organization's potential to realize its project or projects according to these criteria, which are detailed in the guidelines. It's impossible for an applicant to demonstrate evidence of these criteria without a high level of detail throughout the proposal. The panel will look to the applicant to demonstrate the ability to meet the criteria listed. A positive funding recommendation hinges on the clarity of each of the proposed projects in your application, the level of detail provided in all descriptions, and your successful delivery of public projects that align with DCLA's funding priorities. So each budget category has a minimum and maximum funding level. Give your request careful thought and ask for what you think is realistic given the size of your project, your organizational budget, and your DCLA funding history. Collectively, your applications serve as an indication to the city of the legitimate need for cultural funding, and we do want data that is an accurate reflection of that need. For smaller groups with budgets of $250,000 or less, um, those recommendations can range from $5,000 to $50,000. Since DCLA cannot support more than 50% of your total project cost, your combined projects must cost at least $10,000 to apply to DCLA for funding. For larger groups, the minimum recommendation is $15,000, which means your minimum project costs must be $30,000. The maximum in this category is $300,000, and that threshold has only been recommended once in the history of the program. These are the increments panels use to make funding recommendations for organizations with budgets of $250,000 or less. They are printed in the guidelines and range from $5,000 to $50,000. These increments uh, are set to allow more time for concentrated discussion of the projects being considered by that panel rather than a lengthy discussion of dollars. And panels cannot recommend more money than you've requested and can't fund you for less than the minimum award. In this budget category, if you ask for less than $5,000, the panel will not be able to award you anything. Um, in fiscal 2020, the average recommendation for the 
this budget category of organizations with $250,000 or less as their income in FY18 was about $8,300. Recommendations are made at these increments for organizations with budgets of more than $250,000. The minimum award is $15,000 and the maximum award is $300,000 in this category. The average panel recommendation for groups with budgets of above $250,000 was about $42,000 last year. In fiscal year 20, only 23 of the 183 grantees in this budget category were recommended for awards of $100,000 or more. Again, you must request at least the minimum award, which is $15,000 in this budget category, in order to be funded by the panel. Make sure to pay attention to which budget category your fiscal year 2018 operating income puts you in, uh, especially if you've applied in previous years and your budget has grown or contracted. Last year, nine organizations made funding requests below the minimum for their budget categories and were ineligible for funding, and please don't make that mistake. If your organization is funded, notification will take place after the grant period has begun. Please plan accordingly, uh, in particular for summer and fall projects that take place early in the city's fiscal year. We expect each grantee to move forward with the activities proposed regardless of the size of the DCLA award or the timing of our payments. Funds may not move as swiftly as you or we would like and we do appreciate your understanding. Generally, 80% uh, is paid as an advance uh, as early in the fiscal year as possible and the remaining 20% uh, can be paid out only upon completion of services and approval of final reports. In some years, there have been budget adjustments mid-year that have increased or decreased awards slightly, and those adjustments are made when we issue final payments. It was our good fortune in fiscal 20 to have additional single-year funds added to the CDF, which we're apportioned to all funded organizations based on Create NYC priorities, but we do not know if any of these funds will recur in 2021. Because these are public funds, performance evaluation of funded projects is a required part of DCLA's oversight. One component of this evaluation is site visits. There are only a handful of us and over 1,000 of you, so we're not able to visit every year as much as we like to get out and see what you're doing, but we do expect you to put us on your email list and keep us informed of upcoming activities. Funded applicants are expected to have adequate insurance to cover their activities, and we do expect you to be ADA compliant. Um, and follow DCLA's policy for acknowledging the receipt of these funds by including the updated DCLA logo and appropriate credit language in digital and printed materials. All of these expectations are more thoroughly described in the guidelines, including specific policy information for our insurance requirements. So I'm going to pause now to take some questions, if we have some questions. So there's a question asking when and where this recorded webinar will be shared. I believe that it will be prominently featured on our website when it's prepared. I think we're going to just take a couple, a little bit of time to get the closed captioning um, added to it, but then it'll be on the website. Um, what is the grant period, someone asks. Does the program have to have happened before July 2021? Yes, the grant period is June, excuse me, July 1, 2020 through June 30th, 2021. So the programs that you're applying for have to take place within that time frame. So we have a question about um, the organization received 501c3 only in July 2020, um, but we incorporated in 2017. Could we still apply with a fiscal sponsor? Um, I'm going to presume that you mean July 2019, just because July 2020 hasn't happened yet. But um, uh, if you were incorporated in 2017, but you just recently got your 501c3, you could potentially still apply. Um, and if you haven't gotten your 501c3 yet, uh, if July 2020 is really what you meant, and you haven't gotten your 501c3 yet, you would need to apply with a fiscal sponsor, yes. Um, next question, we have filed 990 private PFs um, yes, you can submit a 990 PF form if that's the type of organization, th that's an appropriate 990 for the type of organization you are. That counts as a 990 form. 
Are food festivals considered a cultural activity? Oh boy, okay. So really on its own, food has to be contextualized within a larger cultural um, program. So this might be a question where if you can call the help desk and talk to one of us directly and we get a little bit more information about the type of program it is, um, on the face of it, it might not be the most competitive project, but we would we could talk you through a little bit more about what you're doing if we can talk to you, get a little bit more detail. So call the help desk after the seminar if you can. Last question for now. If we receive city council funding for a program in several New York City schools, can we ask for CDF funds to reach new schools not funded by the council? Um, potentially, yes, that's possible. I think that ultimately you're going to ask us to uh, support you for a project that you're doing and depending on the type of city council funding that you're receiving, it might be that it can be combined together and fund the same activity in the CDF proposal or it might be that it needs to be separate schools. So we're going to, I'm going to talk a little bit more about city council in the next couple of slides that might help clarify that. But uh, yes, the short answer to your question is yes. Um, so that might also be if you want to talk to someone a little bit more and get a little bit more de uh, in-depth response to what you're thinking about, uh, either call your program officer if you have one or call the help desk for a little bit more information. All right, so we're going to keep moving. Um, oops. All right. So as I mentioned, this next little bit is about um, the role of elected officials in our funding process. Uh, again, feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box found at the bottom of your screen. The support and partnership of the city council, its speaker and its cultural affairs committee is critical to our funding process. Not only that, but they devote considerable funding to culture in all 51 council districts of New York City. You do wanna keep your council members informed of what you're doing by sending them a copy of this excuse me, application and inviting them to in events and programs, um, especially if you want to seek funding from the council, the, you have to complete their application as well as ours. Um, they have a process separate from the agencies for making funding decisions, and we want you to know and understand how both processes relate and what's required of each. DCLA administers several different uh, and distinct funds for cultural activities. In order to be eligible for any initiative or council support that is administered by the Department of Cultural Affairs, organizations are required to be eligible for and complete an FY21 CDF application. This CDF application is the key to eligibility for any grants this agency administers. Um, and if you fail to meet the February 18th deadline, your organization will not be able to receive funds through the Department of Cultural Affairs for this fiscal year. This applies to city council funding, um, potentially capital funding, and agency specific initiatives that are um, established under the Create NYC cultural plan. If you plan to submit requests for a capital project in fiscal 21 from our capital projects unit, uh, that e unit has emailed all previous CDF grantees with further information on that process. Um, no capital requests should be included in your CDF proposal. If you plan to apply to any city council member or a delegation for fiscal 21 funds, you must also complete the council's discretionary application in order for DCLA to administer those funds. Their application is also due February 18th and can be found on the city council website. So, Typically for us, uh, city council support takes two main forms. Each year, individual council members may designate cultural organizations for single year support. This is known as discretionary or member item support and is usually allocated through DCLA's budget when it is for cultural activities. In fiscal 2020, DCLA administered over $5 million in discretionary funds to more than 260 cultural organizations for their CDF activities. These discretionary funds can only support the activities in your CDF grant agreement. So be sure to include those activities in this fiscal 21 CDF application. When you approach your council member for support, you must request funds for the activities that you're already included in this proposal to DCLA. 
In addition to discretionary support for CDF activities, the Council has created a number of initiatives which provide single year support for specific purposes. For fiscal 2020, these included CASA, the Cultural After School Adventures Program, CTC, or the Coalition of Theaters of Color, the Cultural Immigrant Initiative, SUCASA, and the Anti Gun Violence Initiative, Art, a Catalyst for Change. While the Council designs these initiatives and designates who will receive funds under them, our agency administers them. And unlike regular discretionary items, these initiative funded projects cannot overlap with any CDF funded activities. So do not include them in your CDF application. This is going back to the question that was about, you know, if you have some schools that are funded through the Council, it's going to depend on the type of funding that you're getting. Um, and again, in order to be eligible for any council support that is designated through DCLA, whether for CDF activities or for one or more of the council initiatives, you're required to submit both the fiscal year 21 CDF application and the council's discretionary application found on the city council website. If your organization is designated discretionary or initiative support, you must comply with additional requirements, including a qualifications check by the city council, clearance by the mayor's office of contract services and mandatory capacity building training for organizations receiving more than $10,000 from the city. We also expect that your organization will be compliant with city and state lobbying laws. You can visit the city council website to identify the council member for your district, um, be in touch with them not just your district, but the districts where you're providing services uh, and learn more about the city council's process and any other requirements that they may have. Okay, we're gonna take some more questions if we have any. Any more questions? Okay, well, um, Thank you. I'm going to pass it on to Ashley to continue with the seminar. Thank you, Laudan. Hello, everyone. This is Ashley Firestone from the Department of Cultural Affairs, and I will be reviewing the online application uh, with you. Um, again, you can use that Q&A function found at the bottom of your screen to ask questions during this section and we'll respond to those questions in batches. Um, our detailed CDF application instructions are available for download from our website at nyc.gov slash culture under the applying tab. So if you haven't already, please go download that PDF uh, to follow along with this section. Uh, we're going to show you several screenshots from the online application and walk you through each of the 11 sections. You can complete the application out of order, which is how we're going to walk through it today. And we do this so that we can talk first about the elements of the proposal that will be the focus of the panel's review. And then we'll move on um, to the remainder of the application. So you may want to complete the application in a similar order. The application is essentially the same as in prior years, for those of you that have done this before. Uh, the character limits for each response remain the same as they were last year in FY20. At each step along the way, we will tell you which section we're at in the instructions document. Again, that should be downloaded from the applying tab on our website, and you can take notes uh, on that directly. But don't just follow along today. Make sure everyone involved in completing the application keeps the instructions on hand. Uh, you can also use that document to confirm that each person working on your application understands the specific response required for each field. You're gonna reach our application through the DCLA website. So from our home page, you'll click cultural funding in the header menu. Then on the left side, grants for organizations in the subheader, and then applying on the menu bar on the left-hand side. From that applying tab is where you can download the PDF copies of the instructions, as I mentioned, as well as the CDF guidelines, the application checklist that you'll need to include in your hard copy materials, and a blank application. This year, we've also added two new resource documents to the website, an IT FAQ document to address common IT issues related to the application portal, and a blank sample of the panelist view application, which I'm gonna give you a preview of right now. 
So this panelist view application is a PDF version of each CDF application submitted, which is formatted and distributed to panelists for their review. The blank panelists view sample application, which is available on the DCLA website, is a useful resource to understand how your application will be viewed by the panelists. A small screenshot is provided here, but you should download the whole document to be able to view it in full size. The panelist view application contains all the pertinent information needed to assess an organization's application. As you'll notice, it's not in the same order as the fields in the online application form itself. Not all of the sections in your application will be viewable or formatted identically. Um, for example, the facilities and venue section of your application is not included in the panelist view application, meaning that relevant venue information must be included in your project description as well. The staff information and board information sections are also not included in the panelist view application. The instructions document is going to include details on which fields are not included for panelist review. The panel reviews the budget overview section carefully. The panelist view application will illustrate your operating and project budgets together in a single page in exactly the format that the panel is going to see it. So we strongly encourage you to review this panelist view sample application before you begin filling out your organization's CDF application online, because this may impact where in the application fields you choose to highlight personal and pertinent information. Once you have viewed that panelist view sample application, you'll return to the DCLA website to launch your own application. You're going to launch your application from this same page where we were before. Um, we have a special announcement that the online application is optimized for Internet Explorer or Safari. We really recommend that you use either one of these free um, uh, browsers because we are not able to provide any other support for browsers like Chrome or Microsoft Edge. This system works best on Internet Explorer or Safari. So you're going to see this launch page for your cultural affairs account. New applicants will need to register their email addresses and organizations. Um, detailed registration information can be found in the registration help guide, which you can also download from the registration section in the About CDF registration tab that you see on the left side there of our website. This is the login page for the CDF application portal. New applicants can register for a new account here. Uh, in April of 2019, our online security policies were aligned with NYC ID, which is New York City's centralized public identity management system. So both new and returning users will now use NYC ID to log in to their account with the DCLA. Uh, for more information on registration and NYC ID, again, you'll download that registration help guide from our website. So now the login page will take users to the NYC ID login. Um, you'll log in using that NYC ID username and password, which must match your DCLA login for you to be able to access your application materials. Once you've logged in, you'll arrive at the CDF portal homepage. This is the homepage for your organization. The first step for every registered applicant is to review the information in your organization's account profile for accuracy and completeness. It's critical for all organizations to keep their account profile and registration information current at all times. The agency is going to use this profile throughout the year to contact your organization. This is how you will receive notification of the application outcome, as well as critical information about other funding opportunities and other information that we share with the field. From the home page, you can view your organization's recent online CDF application and reports. Click the blue Start Application button to begin a new application for fiscal 2021. 
If you applied or renewed last year in FY20, you may want to review the previous submission as a helpful starting point. Remember to take into account any feedback you received from DCLA previously as you prepare this year's application. Once you've started your application for FY21, you can return to this page to open the draft and keep working. We're now on page six of the instructions. As I noted, we're not gonna go in order, but we'll mention the corresponding instructions pages as we move around. And you can also see where we are in the application by looking at the highlighted title in the sidebar. Next, we will guide you through the organization profile section under organization information. There's one thing you need to do on this page before you can do anything else. And that is you must begin by entering your organization's FY18 operating income. This is the figure that we will use to place your organization in the appropriate panel. The figures entered here should match information from your FY18 IRS 990 and should not include in-kind support or any capital income. If you're a social or a multi-service organization, you'll provide only the FY18 cultural income. So in this case, it would not match your organization's 990 filing. Remember to save your work often as you go. The system will log you out after 10 minutes if you haven't saved a page or navigated to a different section of the form. This page will pre-populate with information from your most recent online application. Be sure to check all pre-populated information throughout the application carefully. It is pre-populated for your convenience, but never assume it is still correct or complete for this year's submission. We ask here for information about your executive director or CEO and your organization's address. The organization address refers to your primary administrative address. This is where your office is located. It may be your home or just one address of multiple locations. Select from the drop down menu the council district, community board, and neighborhood that correspond to that organizational address. You'll notice circled question marks throughout the application. These contain help text. Click on any of these to open help text specific to the question. If your mailing address is different from your organization address, complete the mailing address section. You'll only enter text in this field if you identify that it is not the same as your organizational address. You'll provide the organization contact information requested and you must include an alternate cell or home emergency number where DCLA may reach you after hours or in case of emergency. Under general information, you'll enter the organizational code, which identifies your organization by type. The definitions for those codes can be found on page seven of the instructions. The FY18 organization income is only for those multi-service organizations that we mentioned earlier. They should enter their total budget for the organization here, which would be inclusive of the cultural budget required in the FY18 operating income field at the start of this application. If you're using a fiscal sponsor or conduit, enter information here about that organization. You can check with DCLA to confirm that your fiscal sponsor is eligible. Your fiscal sponsor must be aware that you're applying under their sponsorship, so please identify and be in touch with them immediately as they may have additional requirements before you submit. We're now on page eight of the instructions, the mission and engagement section. This section is where you will enter the mission, the history and principal activities of your organization, and then describe your engagement with the public. This section will be the panel's introduction to your organization. So you'll describe that mission, history, and principal activities of your organization, including recent and updated information. This space allows for considerable detail, so please use it well. Be sure to start with your actual mission statement. The mission statement will serve as a barometer in the panel's analysis of your projects. Your mission statement should focus on your organization's objectives, Make sure that in addition to saying what your organization does, you say here why you do it. 
Then go on to provide detailed information on your organizational history and principal activities, including activities for which you are applying to DCLA for support. The mission field is where you can include contextual information about programs for which you're not requesting DCLA support. Uh, so if you do, uh, if your organization tours around the country or if you have educational programs outside of New York City, you could include them here for context, but you need to show the panel that you recognize that they're ineligible for funding and that's not what you're asking for. If you have a regular venue for your programs, you can include that in this uh, principal section as well. In the audience engagement and marketing statement, clearly describe specific engagement and marketing efforts as they relate to the proposed projects. Describe the demographics of your target audience and your participants, the media or outlets you plan to use to connect with them, and include any specific details about your work to make your programming accessible and inclusive for a variety of audiences. For example, uh, efforts that you are making to reduce the economic, social, communication, or physical barriers to participation with your work. This question also asks you to provide information regarding your organization's current and upcoming efforts to assure that our common goals of equity, access, and inclusion lead to representative programming throughout the city. We've posted resources and definitions for diversity, equity, and inclusion topics on the applying tab of our website, which we hope that you'll utilize as part of your ongoing and evolving work around these issues. I'm going to pause to see if anyone has any questions on the initial section of the application. Okay, we haven't received any in this section, but feel free to ask using that Q&A button at the bottom of your page if you have any. So next we're going to review the staff information section, which provides a profile of your staff and board. The details for this can be found on page 12 of the instructions. You'll include all of your full and part-time employees, whether they're paid or unpaid, and the total number of staff. Um, you won't include any volunteers or consultants here. So think of the people that are on your phone tree or have an organizational email. Um, employees are considered full-time if they are permanent staff working 35 hours a week or more, whether they're paid or not. You can consult your SMU data arts profiles for help with answering these questions. Uh, every organization's staffing structure is somewhat different, so if you have specific questions about how to complete this section for your organization, um, we recommend either submitting a question via the Q&A or contacting our help desk. The staff leadership and stewardship section replaced uh, the volunteer program section from past versions of the online application. This is where you're going to describe the efforts your organization is making to reflect diverse representation in your organization's staff, executive leadership, and board. Please address the values of equity, access, and inclusion as they apply to your organization's workforce, as well as your organization's investment in the development of voices currently underrepresented in the broader cultural workforce. This text field has an 800 character limit. We acknowledge that answering such a multifaceted question within the confines of the 800 character limit may be challenging, but do your best to provide a detailed and concise response around your efforts. Character limits throughout the application will be shared with panelists. So this question was added in FY19 um, regarding uh, asking applicants to describe their efforts in contributing to increased diversity in the workforce and on boards throughout the cultural field. So after reviewing those submissions, we've come up with some suggestions for how best to address this question. You'll include as many of these as is feasible for your organization within the character limit. Be specific and intentional. Don't just include EEO boilerplate language. So clearly clarify how your particular organization is making an effort to contribute to a more representative cultural field at large. Include statistics. Contextualize your organization's workforce demographics. Show financial access. Identify how your organization is addressing financial boundaries, such as paying a living wage. Describe decision makers. Focus on your executive staff and board members, not just lower level staff or interns. And identify goals. Address where you have found weaknesses in your organization and what steps you're taking to address them. 
Next, you'll enter information into the staff list, which accepts up to 10 people. Include your principal administrative and artistic staff. These are the people who run your organization and its programs. Be sure to include the executive director, artistic director, and any heads of departments or other principal employees, even if they're already included in your account profile. Salary codes can be found in the instructions on page 12. We're now moving to the board information section, which tells us about your governing board. You can find details on page 13 of the instructions. We ask whether your board has an active committee structure, meaning there are subcommittees, such as a committee on diversity, equity, and inclusion that meet independent of the full board meetings. Indicate the percentage of your operating budget that comes directly from the board and enter the amount each board member is expected to give or get for the organization annually. You can enter up to six board members. If your board is larger than that, you'll enter six board officers and key committee heads into the application form. Regardless of board size, you'll also need to submit a full board list on DCLA's template with your supplemental materials. This template can be found under the applying tab of the programs page of our website. Now we're going to go to the most critical part of this proposal, your organization's proposed services. Please turn to page 22 of the instructions now. The projects section uh, on the sidebar under proposed services is the heart of your application. This is where you tell the panel what you are planning to do in FY21 and how you are planning to do it. The panel will spend the bulk of its time discussing what you put in these sections. The narrative portion of this section is the next thing they will see after they read your mission and engagement sections. In the proposed services section, you'll find the project summary page, um, which lists all the projects for which you are requesting support and is where you can add a new project or edit a project you've already added. If you apply for multiple projects, the project summary page is where you'll prioritize your projects once you've entered them. The panel will read your projects in priority order. You can apply for a maximum of five projects. If you choose to apply for more than one project, make sure that each project includes the same level of details as all the others. To begin a new project proposal, click the new project blue button. Farther down on the project summary page is where your project costs and request amount are displayed. Note that you cannot request, uh, you cannot enter numbers here. These fields calculate automatically from your entries in the, each of the project budgets that we're gonna talk about in a moment. Uh, check these fields closely though, after you have finished entering your projects. They need to make sense within the context of the project, the organization's budget, and DCLA's guidelines. And remember that while you cannot request more than 50% in the total project cost, you must request at least the minimum award for your budget category. Last year, several groups requested less than the minimum, and although the panelists found their proposals very compelling, they could not be awarded funding. So make sure that you check the threshold for your budget category carefully and request at least the minimum amount in each in that category. The discipline and borough section on the project summary page are for your entire application. Select one discipline and one borough based on what best describes your application as a whole. This will determine which panel reviews your application. If you provide services in multiple locations, pick the borough that best conveys the primary location of your activities. If your project spans different disciplines, you'll just pick the one that your organization specializes in or you can pick one of the multidisciplinary sections. For example, a dance company that has an area where it displays visual art should be evaluated with other dance applicants, not as a visual arts organization or as a multidisciplinary group. Depending on the volume of applications, some disciplines are grouped together for panel review. I'm now gonna to move to page 23 of the instructions. When you click the new project button on the project summary page, you're brought to the three substantive parts of the proposed services section. The first is an overview for you to provide general information and a synopsis of this particular program. In the middle there, you'll see the details section for the narrative and other specific information about this project. 
And on the right, the budget section for financial information specific to this project. You'll first be directed to the overview page. The first thing you'll do is title your project. Be concise. Examples of a project title might be the main stage series or the exhibition program. After you title the project, you can save it and it will show up in your project summary list. Project cost and request amount will automatically populate based on the total of all the expenses that you will enter on the project budget page. So these fields can't be edited from the project overview page directly, but you can adjust these figures in the project budget page. The next three sections, sections, the discipline, borough, and council district are specific to this project. So be sure to select only the boroughs and council districts where the services in that project will take place. The synopsis should be a brief summary that includes quantifiable project details like the type and number of events, prices, dates and venues where possible. Um, be concise, but don't provide a list. This is a narrative section. We recommend that you complete the synopsis after you have written your project description, since this is a synopsis of that information. Make sure that all of the information contained in your synopsis is also found in the project description. The synopsis will be the panel's introduction to your program. It is the first thing they will read about your project, and it will also be included in your grant agreement if funded. These two boxes, the proposed services beyond FY21, will appear only if your organization is in that larger budget category of organizations with budgets over $250,000 and uh, being considered for a multi-year award. This is the only place that you'll describe anticipated activities in fiscal 22 or fiscal 23. After you've completed the project overview, you'll move forward to the project details. The instructions are very, very detailed about how to complete this project narrative, so be sure to refer to them for guidance when completing it. Let's talk first about defining and organizing your project. A project has a distinct intent and objectives and is a distinct program that may also have a distinct audience. <coughs> Excuse me. A main stage season that includes different productions happening over the course of a season, a main stage season would be one project. A separate project might be a series of lecture demonstrations in schools um, or something along those lines. You should consider grouping activities that share similar goals, content, or audiences as a single project. You must make a case for your program in the ways we're about to discuss, not just provide a list of events. Remember, the focus of CDF support is services to the public. We look to the applicant to define its public and describe the access that it provides. It's up to you to clearly define the public you are serving. DCLA funds projects of both breadth and depth, those that reach a broad range of people, as well as those that provide a depth of service for a small number of people. Your public could be anything from five participants in a series of workshops to 5,000 people at an outdoor concert. If you're projecting to serve more people this year than you have historically, you need to share your plans for increasing your audience or service recipients. A strong project narrative contains all of the relevant details. This is a 3,500 character narrative section with room to fully describe your project. You wanna use this space to write a lively, compelling narrative that's going to make the case for support of your projects to the panel. So be as specific as possible. Answer the questions who, what, when, where, why, how, how many, and how often. Use every opportunity to include specific details such as partner names, artist names, actual locations or school partners, locations, numbers of performances or sessions, and other information that will help the panel understand the scale of your program. Your highly detailed narrative should address how the project serves the public and has public access, how the project connects with your mission, what the objectives are and how you will determine success, and the curatorial process, including how artistic decisions are made, such as who to exhibit or what play to do, and who makes those decisions. If you plan to apply for more than one project, 
Make sure to include as much detail in your subsequent project narratives as you do in your first. The panel will expect the same high level of detail for each of your proposed services. Remember that the panel makes its funding decisions based on the application as a whole. Panelists may not select particular projects for funding and they can see if you've copied language from one project to another. Detail about an ancillary program is as important as the detail about your core program. For example, if you describe an exhibition in great detail, but tack on a sentence that says, we'll also have public events like lectures and tours, the panel will want to know how many tours and lectures, when will they take place, who will serve uh, in leading those, and who will be served as an audience. So make sure that you provide all of those details. You may reference your background materials here, but please note that the background materials do not substitute for content in the project description narrative. All key elements of your project for which you're requesting support should be included here. Now we get the question a lot, what if we don't know all the details yet? We recognize that this is uh, in, in some cases almost two years in advance. So we understand that some specifics might not be confirmed when the application is submitted. When this is the case, you just wanna be sure to include as much detail as you can about how you're gonna go about making the decisions that will make the project a reality, including when those key decisions will be made, who the key decision makers are, and what aspects are going to help you to make those decisions. Review your text carefully to see where you can share specific information with the panel. They'll be reviewing your proposals with the charge to invest city funds, which are taxpayer dollars, in the strongest services to New York City. In order to feel confident in that investment, they need to know the names and credentials of individuals involved, the specific content of the programs, the duration and frequency of events, and the specific locations where the program will take place. Again, if you aren't yet sure, provide details about how and when those decisions will be made. Even if a panelist isn't familiar with a specific individual or location, the inclusion of those specific details will give them confidence in your plans for the upcoming grant cycle. The paragraph that is on your screen now includes information about upcoming programs. Uh, the language, though, lacks specifics, such as the number of seminars, who will conduct them, and how they will take place. This is an example of what you might see in a project description. But in contrast, this second paragraph includes many more critical details. The number of seminars proposed, the details about the direct recipients and expectations for upcoming grant period, the staff names and references to bios and the supplemental materials, and information about confirmed venues as well as those under consideration. These kinds of details will help the panel to evaluate the content and quality of your programs and assess how they will meet the stated criteria for funding. We know that the number of characters is limited, but we also know that it's possible for organizations to present comprehensive proposals with all the details included. We've seen it, we know it can be done. Just as you know from your own public materials, the presentation of your language is important. Be sure that your text is presentable. Use proper spacing and carriage returns, which only count as a single character, and note the constraints of the online form. Some formatting tools, such as bold, italics, and underline, are unavailable. If you copy and paste, the text may not appear as you entered it in a word processing program. One long paragraph or text with many abbreviations will be difficult for the panel to review. Use the yellow print preview button found at the bottom of your project summary page to preview what the text will look like to the panel and edit accordingly. But don't embed links in your narrative. The panel is instructed not to investigate any outside URLs while reviewing your application. I'm gonna show you two identical texts. The one on the left includes paragraph breaks and the information is highlighted by the judicious use of capital letters. On the right hand side is a dense paragraph peppered with ampersands and abbreviations, but containing exactly the same information. The one on the left allows the reader, the panelist, to find key information on the page. The other 
uh, makes it far too difficult to do that. And panelists tell us it's annoying to read. After you've filled out your project narrative, uh, you'll enter the first and last dates of your project here. You can note additional key dates in the project description. If you don't yet know specific start or end dates, you should enter the first and last day of the month in which you expect the project to take place. The number of direct recipients refers to the individuals who are the focus of your service. The indirect recipients are any other individuals served other than the direct recipients of your project. For example, if you have a training program for 15 actors with a culminating show attended by 400 people, your direct recipients are the 15 actors and the 400 audience members would be indirect recipients. In your project description, ensure that you provide a detailed description of your direct recipients and you can include some information about your indirect recipients too. If your program is a publication or it takes place online, your number served should realistically reflect individual readers or users from within New York City and in FY21 only. The specific audience section is a multi-select list where you'll identify your target population who are the recipients of the services you're providing. Select as many as are appropriate, but use general if there is not a targeted audience. Tell us whether or not you'll charge for this service. Free services are great, but by no means required. Uh, many of the projects we fund have a fee to attend or participate in. So just let us know whether you will charge. And if so, you'll describe the pricing structure and who pays. Uh, this could be a ticket buyer for a concert or a school might be paying you for residency. Be specific here, please. Try to quantify those costs by providing a dollar amount or a range. And then if you have a discount program, please describe who gets the discounts and if there is a scale of discounts that you use. Finally, you'll indicate whether and if uh, and how artists are compensated or if artists pay to participate in the program. Turning to page 26 of the instructions, the education program section refers specifically to projects that are serving children in grades pre-K through 12. This section does not apply to adult education programs. If the program serves children in grades pre-K through 12, select from the drop-down menu which category of education program best fits this particular project. The instructions include definitions for each of these categories. Describe to the evaluation practices of the program and how and with whom you collaborate on the project. I'm going to pause here. We've got a couple of questions that I'm going to tap into from the most recent section. Can you repeat the difference about, uh, can you please repeat about the difference between the full budget and the cultural budget? Yes. For organizations whose mission, primary mission is not one that is dedicated to arts and culture, we want to see your full organization budget um, in the section that mentions full budget. And we want to see your, um, your cultural budget in the FY18 operating income section. So the FY18 operating income is for your cultural income from FY18. And the FY18 organization income is for your overall multi-service organization's income in that base year. Thank you for the question. The next one is for the board gifts as a percentage of income question, should we include gifts that we receive from the board on top of their annual board contributions? Yes, you absolutely should. And that should be based on your last uh, completed fiscal year. Okay, thank you for those questions. We're gonna move along. Uh, we're gonna turn next to the project budget. Each project requires a budget that is specific to the project and you can find details on page 27 of the instructions. The fields on this page should only reflect what you anticipate spending and receiving for this project. You'll see the same fields that are gonna be required in the organizational budget that Stacy is gonna discuss with you. Be sure to enter the project budget based on the grant period, which is the city's fiscal year. We talked about this earlier, July 1st of 2020 through June 30th of 2021. 
Um, the project budget should be based on that time frame. And your operating budget then, which we'll address later on in the seminar, should be entered according to your own organization's fiscal year. Uh, you can note again the help text buttons next to each field on this page, those little question marks that are in circles. Um, the instructions also have detailed definitions for each corresponding field in this section. You do have to have an entry for every single field in order for this portion of the application to be considered complete. You can enter a zero if you don't have income or expenses in that budget category. You'll begin by entering earned income and the unearned or non-government income. And moving down the lines on the project budget, you'll come to that unearned government income, which is where you will enter your FY21 CDF request for each individual project. If you're applying for multiple projects, your requests for each project will be added together to represent your total request to DCLA for FY21. When you enter your request in the DCLA project request box, think strategically about what you realistically expect from DCLA, given all the other sources of income for the project. As noted earlier, when LADAM was presenting, uh, DCLA cannot fund more than 50% of a project's cost and rarely approaches that level of support. Um, the average award was 7% of total project costs in FY20. Now this figure is an average across a wide range of requests under 50%, and your request may be more or less than that average. Enter the request amount in DCLA project request, and it will automatically be added to the total request amount on the project summary page. Make sure to include any non-initiative council discretionary funds that you expect to receive for these projects in the DCLA project request field. DCLA other refers to initiative funds. Remember the projects in your CDF application cannot overlap with activities funded by these initiatives. So the DCLA other line in your project budget is pre-populated to be zero for all applicants. Of course, if you have received initiative designations in the past or you're projecting them for FY21, that funding should be included in your actual and anticipated operating budgets, but it should not be in the project budget. Um, and keep in mind that neither DCLA capital funding nor any other capital funding at all should be included here or anywhere else in this application. Anticipated funding on this page is funding specific to this project. You must indicate with an asterisk funds that are actually committed or received for the project. You want the panel to know what support, if any, is already in place. At the bottom of the project budget, you'll enter information about this project's expenses. Personnel is separated into administrative, artistic, and technical. There are definitions for what this includes in page 18 of the instructions. Make sure to include in the figures here only personnel who are paid as employees and for whom you make withholding deductions on a W-2. Figures should be gross salaries, including fringe benefits. Anyone to whom you issue a 1099 should be included in the outside professional services field. Um, I'm seeing a couple of folks raise hands. If you have questions, you can feel free to type them directly into the Q&A. The button is at the bottom of your screen. From this page, you can return to the project summary page using the yellow button on the bottom right corner, which is where the totals are automatically calculated. Uh, we advise that you review the project summary again before submitting to make sure that your total project cost and total request amount are what you want them to be. Remember that your project requests must add up to at least the minimum award in the budget category in order for your application to be considered for funding. Remember, keep in mind those groups who requested zero in the last couple of years and could not be funded. I am sure that they will not forget, but I don't want anyone on this webinar to forget either. So be sure that you complete this section accurately. Also on the project summary page, you can check the status of each project to make sure it is labeled complete. 
If it's not, some component is missing and you'll need to go back and check for missing data. If you make adjustments to the project budgets, please make sure that you're making corresponding adjustments to the operating budget for the upcoming fiscal year, and if necessary, to the budget notes as well. Does anyone have any questions about the project budget portion of the application? Or the project narrative? Okay, um, we're not getting any questions right now, so I'm gonna introduce my colleague, Stacy McMath, who's gonna uh, review the remaining sections on the application with you. Hello. Um, to all you out there. So Ashley just talked about preparing the budgets for your projects and I'm going to talk about how you present your organization's operating budget. Um, that operating budget is really a critical element of your organization's proposal and one of the ways that you will demonstrate fiscal responsibility to the panelists. So you can turn to page 14 of the instructions. Um, so you're going to enter operating budgets for the previous year, the fiscal, the current, sorry, the previous year, the current year, and the projected year, fiscal year 19, 20, and 21. The current year figures are going to um, include your complete annual budget. That's not a year-to-date budget, and they will include some projected information. Remember those fields from the previous year and the current year will be pre-populated if you submitted an application or renewal recently. You must update all of those fields, especially since in nearly all cases, the figures were projected when you submitted them last year. Remember that the figures for the operating budget are for your organization's fiscal year, right? That fiscal year will, end, will match those on your 990 and financial statements, and they might be different from our July to June grant period. You'll be able to see the project and operating budgets together in the budget overview page, which you can access by clicking the yellow button in the top right corner of the operating budget page, um, or on that final review and submit page. So we'll talk about that budget overview a little bit more in a few minutes. As you're completing and entering your figures, you should review to the operating budget section of the instructions, beginning on page 16, where you'll find specific definitions for each of those budget fields. You can also consult the help desk, uh, help text, by clicking those little question mark buttons. Numbers that vary by more than 20% between consecutive fiscal years, as well as entries in the categories labeled other, must be explained in the budget notes, which we'll look at soon. Remember to save often, especially when working on the budget part of the application form. As we mentioned earlier, the system will log you out after 10 minutes if you don't save. So you'll start by entering your organization's earned income and unearned non-government income. Um, and throughout those budget subtotals and totals will calculate automatically. I wanna highlight a few fields in the unearned government income section. Um, there are details on page 17 of the instructions. The DCLA program services line should include both your CDF and any member item funds for CDF activities that either you've received in previous years or expect to receive through DCLA in fiscal year 21. As Ashley talked about in the project budget section, DCLA other is for non-CDF funding administered by DCLA. Uh, include council initiative funds in your operating budget on this line. Your capital income and expenses, if you have them, are entirely separate. So please do not include any DCLA capital funding in this operating budget. The definitions for the personnel categories are the same as they were in the operating budget and in the project budget. Staff salaries here should include fringe and benefits. Independent contractors, so people for whom you don't deduct withholdings, should be included in the outside professional services field. The yellow budget overview button on the operating, page, uh, operating budget page brings you here. So this is the budget overview page. It will display your three-year operating budget, 
each of your unique project budgets and your total project budget figures together. You cannot enter information here. It will populate based on the budget figures you entered in other parts of the online form. So this is a tool that we provide so that you can review all of your budget information in one place. And this is similar to how the panel will see your numbers. You want to make sure the logic between your budget figures is clear. The panel will spend a significant amount of time discussing your budget figures and also those accompanying notes. So make sure that there are no errors. All of the expenses for your projects need to be accounted for in your organizational budget. If there are discrepancies due to variations between your fiscal year and DCLAs, make sure to explain them in the budget notes. The budget notes section here is where you'll provide an explanation for the operating budget figures that you've entered. It is essential to be thorough when completing this section. The panel will look to the budget notes to provide essential context for your operating budgets. Very rarely should budget notes have NA as a response. These notes are applicable to almost every organization. Don't miss the opportunity to tell the financial story of your organization. In addition to the instructions, um, have a copy of that operating budget from either the print preview or budget overview at hand while you're filling out this section. For the fiscal year variation question, you'll identify all budget lines that vary by more than 20% between consecutive fiscal years and explain each of those variations here. The other sources of income and expenses section requires detail for entries in the FY21 budget lines noted. Explain what the budget numbers represent in each of the fields listed. For example, if you intend to provide, say, training to your teaching artists in fiscal 21, you could enter a note that says outside professional services, $5,000 for unconscious bias training. The surplus deficit question asks you to explain how you're addressing any surplus or deficit that occurs in any of the three years you have entered the, on the operating budget pages. Uh, enter the value of all in-kind support received or anticipated in the current fiscal year, so that's fiscal 20, and specify the sources of that support in the fields below. This section helps the panel understand how your organization might provide services at a level not equivalent to your income figures. You include just major goods or services or donated items, including maybe donations from materials for the arts, and an actual or estimated value associated with each major donation. Please be realistic in the way that you assign value to those in-kind contributions and salaries. Uh, remember, this is the only place in the application where you reflect in-kind support. It won't be included in either your operating budget or your project budget figures. Next up is the further explanation field where you'll provide details about anything in your budget that you think might stand out and was not addressed elsewhere. Points here might include explanations of significant budget growth or decline. Um, or maybe project and organizational budgets that when compared need more explanation. For example, if your fiscal year differs from DCLAs, you may need to explain why some aspects of your organization budget do not correlate directly to the project budgets. This is additional space that allows you to explain your organization's unique financial circumstances and we highly recommend that you use it. Next is a section called budget information where we ask about major budget increases or decreases um, in the future. And this is a dynamic field that will appear only for organizations with FY18 budgets over $250,000. This information looks forward to the two subsequent fiscal years that might be covered by a multi-year grant. Next up, special funds. Um, special funds are accounts in the form of endowments, cash reserves, and other investment vehicles. Not every organization will have them. Um, but if you do, you can enter information here about up to four special funds. If you have more than four, you can give additional information at the bottom of the funding plan template 
that will be submitted with your printed supplemental materials. So I'm just gonna check in and see if we have questions about the operating budget. Looks like we have one question. Um, someone writes and says, my company has just come out of a dormant period where we haven't been raising or spending money for the past two years. Prior to that, however, we were producing work on the same scale as we'll be working in fiscal 21. As such, fiscal 18 and 19 make the company look like it doesn't do anything. Um, does that make us ineligible or is there a place we can explain that particular history? So this is a great question. Um, you will need to have some income and expenses in fiscal year 18 and 19 in order to document your organization's two-year track record. So it sounds like there were some small income and expenses in those two years. Um, and the budget notes would be a good place to explain that the organization is coming out of a dormant period and that's why um, the fiscal 19 figures are going to look very different from the current year 20 and the projected 21. Please note that your organization will be placed in a panel based on that FY18 operating income. So if it was under $250,000, you'll go to one of those borough specific panels. Um, if either one of those years, your income was zero, um, you're likely to not be eligible in this year, but you can call the program's help desk and talk that through with one of the program staff. Okay, so we're going to move on um, and we're going to continue to jump around just a little bit. So the next thing that we're looking at is previous activities. These are activities that should relate directly to your proposed services for fiscal year 21. The panel will look at these activities as an indicator of your capacity, uh, your past service to the public, number of people served, and venues that you've worked in previously. Make sure that your project narrative addresses any plans for project growth or reasons for contraction. The panel is likely to compare your previous activities and constituents serve to what you have proposed in the current or upcoming year. So you'll enter activities that actually took place in the 18 month period prior to this application between July 1st, 2018 and February 18th, 2020. This activity description allows 250 characters. So provide information beyond just the name of the project and you can put like with like to minimize the number of previous activities you can include. Um, perhaps you have three main stage productions. Those would be one activity, not three. You can enter up to eight previous activities and you can also set the priority of each activity to arrange them in your preferred order with that set priority button. Moving up the sidebar, we'll look next at attendance and education. Details can be found on page 10 of the instructions. And here you'll provide attendance figures for your organization's completed fiscal year 2019. So this is attendance for activities within New York City only. Don't include attendance for your international tour or your education program in Yonkers. Web-based programming is for interactive web programming and services, such as integrated artist registries or an online video gallery. This isn't for the number of visits to your homepage or reservations that you accepted online. Uh, just as with attendance figures, we're looking here for the number of unique New York City participants in those web-based programs. So use a tool like Google Analytics to estimate the population served within the city. Try not to double count individuals. Um, for example, students that participate in your education program might also attend a public performance. Don't count those students twice, only count them in the education section. Include all of the cultural activities that you provided in New York City, not just those for which you are applying. And down below attendance, um, you'll see an ethnicity section, which is optional. It's helpful for us to track aggregate information across the city, but responses here are not reviewed by the panel. 
Next up, we ask about ADA compliance. And for arts organizations, frequently that takes the form of access issues. Briefly describe here how you make your work accessible and inclusive to those with different types of disabilities. And below, if you provide any education programming to children in grades pre-K through 12, complete the education program section, uh, even if you're not applying to CDF for those programs. There'll be a place to indicate what percentage of the cost of providing your education services came from each of these listed sources in fiscal year 19. That percentage must equal 100%. Next, we'll, go, we'll review the facilities and venues section. Uh, you can find more information on the instructions in, on page nine. Most of the facilities and venues section is not distributed to panelists. So make sure that any important information about venues for your organization or programs is included in the project description. In the first section, hours open to the public, if you don't have a facility or it isn't open to the public, enter NA. Primary physical facility refers to the location of your office space. There's a question later that allows for a list of additional venues that your organization uses. The questions immediately following primary physical facility will um, depend on your answer to this question. For example, if you indicate that you own your facility, you'll be asked questions about whether you purchased it or if it's a shared space. Next, you'll indicate what percent of your organization's annual budget is spent on space for social or multi-service, religious or educational institutions whose primary mission is not cultural. You would indicate here just the percent of your annual total operating budget that you spend on cultural space. Primary locations can include multiple venues. For example, office space, as well as theaters or schools you work in that are separate from your primary physical facility. Be sure to include the capacity of each space and you can list those spaces in priority order. We also ask a question about recent or upcoming relocations, changes in your venue or capital projects. It's important for the city to track space needs and trends within the cultural community. Okay, so you can turn to page 29 of the instructions. We're getting now to the final steps of the online form. On this page, you'll verify your organization's tax exempt status and let us know about your insurance policies. <clears throat> Let's review the materials you will need in addition to the online form. Uh, in order for your organization's application to be considered complete. These supplemental materials are hard copy submissions that are separate from the online form. They supplement the material uh, provided in the application form itself. So the supplemental materials have the same deadline as the online form. That's 1159 on February 18th, but begin to collect and prepare them as soon as you can. A complete list of supplemental materials can be found at the bottom of this page in the online form, also in the application checklist and in the instructions. We will be using your financial documents to establish New York City residency for your organization. If any of these documents have addresses outside of the boroughs, uh, please call the help desk and talk to a program officer um, to see if that will affect your eligibility. If you hand deliver your supplemental materials, DCLA will provide you with a hard copy receipt. Please hold on to that receipt as well as a copy of the materials you submitted until you have received confirmation that your application is complete. In an effort to make the process for delivering supplemental materials a little more equitable and a little more accessible, um, please note some changes to our procedures from past years. As always, we strongly urge you to submit supplemental materials in advance of the deadline. And you can do that either via hand delivery to the Department of Cultural Affairs offices at 31 Chamber Street during weekday business hours, that's 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. prior to the deadline. Uh, please go to reception in room 201 on the second floor. Or you can mail your materials 
taking into account that the documents must be received by February 18th. Uh, last year, we received over 800 competitive CDF proposals, and many of those were submitted on the day of the deadline. We have only a handful of program staff, um, so our ability to assist any one of those 800 plus applicants, whether in person, over the phone, via email, on that last day will be limited. So please work in advance to assure that we are available to assist you and answer your questions. Um, it helps us if you don't wait until that final day. We strongly suggest submitting your materials before February 18th. If you must deliver your materials on the day of the deadline, there are several options available. Um, so, DCLA staff will accept supplemental materials in our offices at Chamber Street until 1159 on the day of the deadline. Please note this is the same time the online application will close. Subway service may not be regular at that time, so plan to arrive prior to 1159. Um, we also have borough drop-off satellite locations, and those will be available to applicants from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. only on Tuesday, February 18th. Those sites will not be able to accept supplemental materials prior to 10 a.m. on February 18th or after 2 p.m. on that date. Um, so that location uh, list includes Bedford-Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation in Brooklyn, Longwood Art Gallery at Hostos Community College in the Bronx, Materials for the Arts in Queens, and Staten Island Makerspace in Staten Island. It is actually Staten Island Arts, um, I have been corrected. So here is the correct address for Staten Island, Art Space at Staten Island Arts, 23 Navy Pier Court. Okay. Some highlights to keep in mind about the supplemental materials. The DCLA templates are provided for the board list and funding plan, so everybody will submit those. And if you're a social, multi-service, religious, or educational institution, there's a template for the organizational budget where you'll share your full budget. Um, background materials such as teaching artists or artist bios, press, or lesson plans, those are an important illustration of the work that you do and they substantiate the services you'll be proposing. Refer to the instructions for specific examples of this sort of material um, and we suggest that your packet should be curated, it should be recent, and it should be related to the projects being proposed. Remember that while the background material illustrates your organization's work for the panel, these materials are not a substitute for application content. Make sure any details the panel needs to know are in the application itself. So you will create two identical sets of those required documents that you're submitting as background materials, and please fasten them with two binder clips. Don't put your materials in like fancy binders or put each page in a plastic sleeve. We aren't able to file those materials. Just label each item with your organization's name and fasten it with a binder clip. Limit your supplemental materials to what fits in one envelope no bigger than 12 by 15 and send all the materials in the same package at the same time. Um, as guidance, if you cannot carry your supplemental materials comfortably in one hand, you have compiled too much. Please edit your submission to something the panel can actually digest. All CDF applicants are required to file a cultural data project profile uh, with our partners at SMU Data Arts. The information gathered in the data profile is the same as it was before their merger with Southern Methodist University and for returning applicants, your previous data arts submissions will still be available when you log on to the SMU Data Arts website. You're required to create a data profile for your fiscal year 18, um, entering information from your audited or reviewed financial statements, if that's applicable for your organization. Once the profile is complete, you'll generate the funder report for the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs Cultural Development Fund. Print it and include it with your hard copy supplemental materials. Although there is a button that says submit report to funder, we require a hard copy printout. 
Um, make sure that you send the correct report. You can see here what it looks like. Don't send the complete data profile or the report for another funder. Um, you can see here what that CDF funder report looks like. And we do recommend that you enter more than one fiscal year's worth of data into the CDP. Um, as you can see, the funder report will show your most recent three fiscal years. Those of you who have filled this out previously will see prior information pre-populated, um, but FY18 is the minimum requirement to be eligible for the CDF process in fiscal 21. Note that funder reports marked draft will not be accepted. And once you've entered all of that CDP data, there are more than 70 reports that you can run to analyze, visualize, and identify trends in your organization's fiscal and programmatic activity over time. The tools and information managed by SMU Data Arts can also help you to compare your organization to your peers in the field um, across the country. One of the benefits of the merger with SMU is that all data arts participants now have access to the key performance indicator dashboard. Um, that's a tool created by SMU to allow organizations to compare their trends with others nationwide. Um, so you will have access to that. If you have any questions about SMU data arts or the CDP, please contact their support center. The contact information is here and also on page two of the instructions. Okay, so when you're finished completing the online form, you will acknowledge that you are obligated to submit two parts of the application, both the online form and the supplemental materials. Uh, this is the last step before your final review and submit. Uh, which is here. This final review and submit section displays your entire completed application for your review before submission. You can use the sidebar menu to jump to different sections. Give yourself and other people who prepared the material adequate time to review every section carefully before you submit. The yellow print preview button on the top right of this page allows you to e easily print the application. Be sure to save a copy for your files. And the yellow budget overview button is also on the top right corner of this page next to the print preview button. Don't forget to use it. The final review and print preview will display your responses and any missing fields will be highlighted in red. Um, the online application isn't complete and you can't submit it until all the required information is included. And you can know that because all of the boxes on the sidebar will be checked. Take time to verify that the application is not only complete, but that you're confident it's ready for panel review. You might wanna ask someone not involved in preparing the application to review it uh, for clarity and to give outside perspective. Double check all your entries, including those that are lists to make sure your responses are complete. And as I said, if more than one person worked on the application, make sure everyone confirms that the information is accurate and consistent. We've reached the final certification and release section of the online form. This is a legally binding certification and someone with signatory authority must certify this application on behalf of the organization after thoroughly reviewing the document. Only then can you submit your application. Don't hit that yellow submit application button until you are sure the application is ready for panel review. You cannot change your application after hitting that yellow submit button. Uh, those who have completed the CDF final report might remember that your program officer can release that form for edits after the deadline, and that is not the case for this application. So once you submit, the active users in your account profile will get an automated email confirmation that you've completed the online for portion of the application. Save this email for your records. Uh, if you don't receive that confirmation, check your junk mail folder before you call us. The email will include your fiscal 21 application number and another copy of that application checklist, uh, even if you've already submitted your supplemental materials. Your application number is assigned automatically once your completed online form is submitted. So we can't give you that application number before we receive your online application. 
Okay, so we've worked our way through the entire fiscal 21 application. Um, something to note, we're going to be sending out panelists nominations to the field. We hope that you'll consider nominating yourself or a colleague to serve on our grant making panels. As ever, we are intentionally seeking a diverse panel cohort that's representative of the broad cultural constituencies of the city of New York. And we want to give you one last reminder that everything we just covered needs to be submitted by February 18th, 2020 to meet the deadline and be eligible for funding. Please do not wait until the last minute. Complete a draft, give it to someone whose opinion you trust for a critical read and have them identify parts that need clarification or more detail. Begin to compile materials needed for your supplemental packet now so that you can be sure it's ready and gets to us by or before February 18th. Remember February 18th is not the first day you can submit, it is the last day you can submit. If you have questions after today's webinar, you can always return to the instructions, to the archived version of this presentation, or you can call the help desk at 212-513-9381. And um, we'll take questions now um, about this application. Okay, so someone asks, how do I follow up um, if I'm interested in being a part of the panel? And the answer is we will have a, no, a nomination form that is live on our website starting um, in the next, oh, it is live, it's live, oh, great. Um, it is live and if you look in um, the, the Q&A, you will see that um, the link is there. So you can go to our website and nominate yourself or someone that you think should serve. Um, and then someone else asks, is the deadline the end of the business day? The, the deadline is 11.59 p.m. on Tuesday, the 18th of February. That is when both the online application portal will close, um, and it is also the last time that staff will be accepting materials here at 31 Chambers Street. Someone else asks, is it possible to apply with the same project we've applied with in the past? And the answer is yes. If you have services that meet our criteria and priorities that you have provided and been funded for in the past, um, you're certainly welcome to seek support for those services in the upcoming fiscal year. As always, you'll want to give really good detail in your application about what the services are that you'll be providing, who you're providing them to, how you're reaching that audience, um, everything that, that we ask for in this proposal. Okay, so uh, we've worked our way through the remaining questions. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us on this, our historic first ever webinar. Um, and we look forward to speaking with you on the help desk, meeting you when you drop off your supplemental materials and seeing your proposals for fiscal year 21. Thank you so much.